Michael Smith, Michael Smith. Nice. Keena Roll, Keena Roll. Nice. Keisha Stubbs, Keisha Stubbs. Nice. Stephen Lowe, Stephen Lowe. Oh, ho, ho, naughty. Get on the nice list this Christmas. Rejoice with Rare Voice when you sign up and enter to win 12 days of giveaways, including a 2015 Jeep Wrangler. Local web shop What Fall closes its doors, leaving employees shocked. The Prime Minister says the constitutional referendum less than six months away. And a call for stronger air safety regulations in the wake of two fatal plane crashes. We've got those stories and more coming up tonight. I'm Dana Smith and MB12 starts right now. Coffee news tonight, just one day before the revised Gaming Act took effect, a local web shop chain closed its doors for good reportedly without telling its employees. According to workers of What Fall, it was only supposed to be a temporary closure. And as we hear in this report, many customers were not even paid their winnings. Kyle Joaquin has the story. Now that the revised Gaming Act has taken effect, another local web shop has closed its doors. But it's the people that once worked here who say they have gotten the bad end of the deal. Employees of the Woodfall webshop chain say all they want now is the money they've already worked for. According to these employees, there was a meeting held two weeks ago to inform them that the store would be closing for a short period, but would be opening just days later. However, when they returned to work on the day the store was scheduled to open, there was a sign informing customers that the store was now closed. In addition, Tiffany Clark, a former employee, says when they contacted their manager or any of the executives, they were informed they had nothing more to do with the webshop. No notice. I showed up for work on the 16th that evening. Nobody called me and tell me don't come to work. Nothing. When I went to work, I met on the door. Sorry, we're closed. That was it. What they said in the meeting was that in, in eight days, they were, they were going to reopen and we were going to be paid when the store opened. After that, we heard nothing. Eight days is up and we can't reach anybody. We're calling managers that we know to be our managers who are now telling us they have no affiliations with Woodfall anymore. Okay. So who do we turn to? Being in a position, I was in the sec security supervisor. Um, well, trying to contact these fellas has been a hectic situation until like uh, maybe last night. I got the uh, numbers sitting on us and it's just nothing, nothing, nothing at all, you know. Woodfall had about 13 locations with a staff complement of about 60. During the weeks leading up to the 2013 gaming referendum, members of the Vote Yes camp based their campaign off more jobs for Bahamians. However, these employees said they kind of expected something like this to happen, as there were reportedly often times when it was difficult for them to be paid. We have staff who has not been paid four weeks to a month, including the customers. But we ain't worried about the customers right now, we worry about ourselves right now. On top of that, no national insurance has been paid for the staff. Go on to national insurance, we can't even. We can't even claim unemployment benefit right now and we out of a job. Christmas coming, VAT coming, New Year's coming, we ain't got nothing. No job, no nothing. They be just left hanging high and dry. But it's not just the workers who are left upset. These employees say on numerous occasions they've had their lives threatened by customers who weren't able to collect their winnings because there was no money to pay them. We have customers with a lot of winnings. They would come in and they would say, oh, come back another day, come back this day. The customers have not been paid. And Back in July, Fantasy Web Shop separated from what fall. Fantasy's president, Davon Jones, informed us that they split because of differences in philosophy. NB12 contacted one of the executives of what fall. However, he informed us that he has nothing to do with the web shop. We then reached out to officials at Percy's The Island Game, the company by which what fall was powered, and they too refused to offer a comment. This angry former employee has one thing to say to the owners of what fall. I'm going away. I need my money. I don't work for y'all. I want my money. Reporting for NB12, I'm Kyle Joaquin. 
The long-awaited constitutional referendum will happen in less than six months, according to Prime Minister Perry Christie, who said today the Constitutional Commission will meet with members of the opposition next week to address concerns over Bill No. 4, which has been a point of contention amongst both opposition and government MPs alike. Vanik Toot reports. Following four delays, Prime Minister Perry Christie told NB12 in an exclusive interview today he hopes to hold a referendum on gender equality no later than June 2015. Christie, who met with Constitutional Commission Chairman Sean McQueenie for nearly two hours today, says he seriously doubts the four constitutional amendment bills will be passed in the House of Assembly before the end of this year. Yes, um, I would like for it to be um, um, most certainly before the end of June, and therefore um, that will be on the success of the campaign and reaching all parts of the Bahamas and getting all you know people really enthused about this because it's a new paradigm for the country. Um, it's going to be looked at by the entire world. The constitutional amendment bills, which will pave the way for next year's referendum, have remained in the committee stage for more than two months. However, National Security Minister Dr. Bernard Nodded said recently government is still committed to the passage of those four bills. Christie says he doubts that will happen before January. No, it doesn't appear to me um, to be a viable proposition that the bills will be uh, moved to final reading um, before um, the Christmas adjournment, but soon thereafter, um, what we wanted to do was to give the opposition time to finish their convention, to get their leadership straight, which they have, and then to be able to hold discussions amongst ourselves as to the way forward. The Prime Minister once again stressed that there must be a degree of unanimity on the gender equality bills. McQueenie says the commission will soon meet with members of the opposition who raised concerns over Bill No. 4, which seeks to end discrimination based on sex. We intend to do that hopefully next week. Uh -huh. Hopefully next week. Uh, we're just trying to coordinate some things. This has been a very busy week with the funerals and so on, but we're hoping to get that off next week, hopefully. The focus of those discussions will be Bill No. 4. McQueenie dismissed former Deputy Prime Minister Brent Simonet's suggestion that Bill No. 4 should be scrapped, insisting that is the foundation for the other three bills. He also noted that the tragic death of Dr. Miles Monroe, who played a major role in the wording of the fourth bill, would not cause a setback. He left a very strong team in place, uh, young lawyers uh, who are continuing to um, make their voices heard. As a matter of fact, one of the members of his legal team has accompanied our team uh, to several of the family islands so that we don't think that will have any effect at all. Um, you know, we have continued to give credit to Dr. Monroe for the present form of Bill Number no. 4 because he was the one who came up with this idea of defining sex to mean male or female. Once that is settled, Prime Minister Christie says they will move forward with this process and put everything behind the public education campaign to ensure Bahamians go to the polls well informed. Um, it's going to be looked at by the entire world and it's something that we want to be really clear, clearly convinced that we have done the best possible job at reaching every Bahamian and getting them to understand what they're voting on. Meantime, McQueenie says the public education campaign on the family islands is going very well. Reporting from the House of Assembly for NB12, I'm Voynich Toot. After several recent plane crashes, the Bahamas Air Traffic Controllers Union President LaShawn Gray is calling on the Minister of Transport and Aviation to establish stronger health and safety regulations within air traffic services. Simone Davis has the details in this report. Since the tragic plane crash that claimed the lives of Pastor Miles and Ruth Monroe and seven others last month on Grand Bahama and another plane crash that claimed the life of one elderly male tourist this week on New Providence after a plane landed in the waters at Clifton Pier, BATCO members are demanding a health and safety committee in the air traffic services to be top priority while urging the government to quickly find a resolution and put safety first. I guess within the past few months, we've had a total of, I think, four, including one this morning, uh, one on Eleuthera, two on Grand Bahama, and now one this morning on New Providence. Uh, it could be, you know, 
not necessarily tied into or related. Some things could just happen to be coincidental. Uh, yes, there does appear to be some level of an increase. Uh, however, we continue to stress the need for uh, health and safety standards throughout the Department of Civil Aviation. And the reason is because of the fact that it is paramount in our industry. It is our number one priority uh, to ensure that we have safe, not just orderly and expeditious flow of traffic, but safe, safety first. Gray also mentioned that health and safety committees are relatively non-existent in government departments and the union would not accept the health and safety meeting held on September 4th where members were summoned to satisfy a trade dispute as the establishment of a committee. She noted that the meetings for the committee never happened. She said the minister should find a way to restore public confidence in the air traffic services of the Bahamas. As BATCO also identifies the minister's need to ensure public confidence, I would be remiss to say that there has been no progress towards establishing a properly functioning health and safety committee. The history of the public sector, however, has continuously proven that articulating a position does not necessarily translate to the establishment and proper implementation of that stated position. If we give consideration to the fact that the Health and Safety Act was established in 2002 and that the current year is 2014, and although b binding on every government department, health and safety committees are relatively non-existent. During a press conference held by the Trade Union Congress on Tuesday, President Obi Ferguson stressed the importance of these stiffer regulations, suggesting that the implementation of a committee would limit the number of plane crash incidents in the Bahamas. Gray added that the union would not withdraw its trade dispute until it is satisfied that the legally mandated committee is established and functioning. To this date, there has been no subsequent meetings. As an organization, we find great difficulty in conceding to the committee as being established when it has no organizational structure, standard operating procedures, and is essentially non-functional. Despite the many positive recommendations reflected in the inaugural meetings minutes by a cross-section of the aviation's professionals. Guardian Radio caught up with the Minister of Transport and Aviation outside the House of Assembly. She would not comment on the union specific issues. However, Gray noted that if their concerns are properly addressed in a reasonable amount of time, it is unlikely that the issue will result in industrial action. NB12 caught up with the Minister of Transport and Aviation this afternoon. She did not specifically address the issues of the union. However, Gray said if their concerns are properly addressed in a reasonable amount of time, it is unlikely that the situation would lead to industrial action. Reporting for NB12, I'm Simone Davis. Nine months after he engaged in a public spat with prominent pastor Dr. Miles Monroe over his stance on gay rights, Foreign Affairs Minister Fred Mitchell said to date he felt compelled to issue a personal statement on Monroe's tragic death. Mitchell said he wanted to make it clear there is a distinct difference between disagreeing with someone and finding a common cause in one's humanity. I believed, Mr. Speaker, it was important for me to issue that statement. Ordinarily, I would have left it to the leaders of the party to make the statement on my behalf. However, in making my own statement, I wished it to be clear that there is a distinction in my mind and conduct and culture between disagreeing with an individual and his philosophy and finding common cause in one's humanity. I would not want anyone to think that I do not appreciate that difference. Back in March, Monroe called for Mitchell to be removed from his cabinet post after Mitchell suggested during a speech in Trinidad and Tobago that it's time CARICOM's charter be updated to ensure a person cannot be discriminated against on the basis of sexual orientation. A back and forth ensued with Mitchell declaring at one point, ignorance is a serious thing. However, Mitchell noted today Monroe made a difference in this world and he was happy the best-selling author defended government's controversial immigration policy shortly before he died in a plane crash last month. The fact is, in his lifetime, Miles Monroe tried to make a difference. And that, as the poet has said, has made all the difference. Before he died, Amongst the last public statements he made, he indicated his support of the policies that we now are pursuing on immigration, which I have the responsibility to superintend. 
that too made a difference. Mitchell was the first to pay tribute to Monroe in the House of Assembly today as MPs remembered Monroe's many achievements. Also paying tribute, St. Anne's MP Hubert Chipman, who suggested a community center be constructed and named in his honor. Monuments of stone or metal are fine, Mr. Speaker, but there's even finer course of action open to us. My wish is that we build at least one grand, well-equipped, well-staffed community center where Bahamians, young and old, can create, can learn creative arts, marketable skills, sound financial planning, conflict resolution, and patriotism. Doing so, we too will be able to claim a direct contribution for forging a community marked by sterling character, noble purpose, honor, great prosperity, and peace. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. When MB12 returns, the Court of Appeal gets a new justice as two more retire. Stay with us.